grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have a very robust voice, so I must ask whether you can hear me. Thank you. Sometimes these things can be deceptive. It's been turned up. I was once preaching at York Minster Baptist Church in Toronto a few years ago, and uh, I was told after my sermon that I had been speaking too close to the microphone, and it kind of distorted things. So I see Russell Elliott here. Maybe he can raise his hand if he doesn't hear me properly. When Tim McFarland set down the general theme of Saturday, Sunday rather, uh, evening sermons as lessons learned from a book, it certainly provided an enormous landscape for me or for any of us. And I pondered the challenge for some time. Should I take something that touched me personally from one of the great classics, ancient or modern, east or west, or should I enlarge on a philosophical or sentimental topic lifted from our own vast Christian historical tradition, or perhaps something from a novel that had touched me personally. And so it was that I chose this latter option, something from a novel that hopefully some of you might also be familiar with. And if not the actual novel, then with the sentiment or phrase from that book that has become so celebrated, so famous that it is uh, often quoted completely out of context, but at the same time can fit so many different situations or circumstances. And the sentiment or lesson learned from a book is this. If we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. Or in another translation, if we want things to remain the same, things will have to change. I am confident that some of you will have encountered this enigmatic observation, but my aim this evening is to place it in its appropriate literary context and then to see how in particular it applies to many situations in life, including politics or household or family affairs and certainly religion, any religion, but in our cultural context, especially Christianity. This somewhat paradoxical sentence is from a famous Italian novel written by Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa and called The Leopard, or Il Gatto Pardo, which he wrote in 1953, but it took 10 years to get it published. Nobody was particularly interested in a novel whose story took place in mid-19th century Sicily. But once the novel was in print, it suddenly took off, immediately recognized as worthy of translation in many languages. It was even made into a first-rate film by the same name in 1963, which some of you are probably old enough to have seen, featuring Burt Lancaster and Claudia Cardinal, no less, and still, I might add, available as a DVD and eminently worth watching, and so much so that had Tim asked me to say something on lessons learned from a film, I would still have chosen this Lampedusa masterpiece. In print now, for half a century, The Leopard continues to sell 100,000 copies a year. That's a testimony, isn't it, to its enduring greatness. Before I give some shared thoughts on the key sentence from this book that I've identified, it might help and be of interest if first I briefly set down something about the author and the novel. Born in Palermo, Sicily in 1896, Lampedusa came from an aristocratic family, the Tomasi, whose former wealth had largely faded away by the 20th century, but they still had uh, access to these titles. Maybe they were honorary, but in Italy they do this sort of thing. 
as the Duke of Palma and the Prince of the Island of Lampedusa. The novel, Il Gattopardo, or The Leopard, refers to the family crest, or cipher, some kind of ocelot, a large wild cat, perhaps even a leopard, symbolic, as family crests of old were wont to be, of character and of boldness. The novel is based on a living person, on Lampedusa's real-life great-grandfather, the Prince Giulio Fabrizio, who was indeed an important landowner and had a palace in Palermo, which incidentally I have had the privilege of visiting, and various estates in Sicily's Agrigento region, the most significant estate for the purposes of the novel being that wondrous place, Donna Fugata. If only we had time to read just one or two pages of the chapter entitled, The Trees. Well, it's near the beginning of the novel, but I, I can't afford to take that time this evening. But I know it would stir your soul, a description of the Tomasi family's two-day journey by horse and carriage around about 1860 from Palermo to the remote, somewhat run-down, but still very beautiful country house, Donna Fugatta. Lampedusa's deafness of words, even in translation, is so fine that though nothing much appears to happen in the novel, a move to the estate in the country, a dinner party, a ball, a rabbit shoot, it all builds up. And it aims to show how, in the mid-19th century, Sicily was more or less excluded from the process of modernization, a kind of contradiction with its splendid cultural life in places like Palermo and Catania, as opposed to the poverty and backwardness of the countryside. Into this historical narrative enters the Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi and his famous 1,000 red shirts, who against all odds succeeded in taking Palermo and Messina and personally persuading the people to merge with the kingdom of Italy. The novel The Leopard then records the vanishing world of an old social order in the face of the mid-19th century Italian risorgimento or resurgence. And in this way, the book is a kind of distillation of an age, a microcosm of huge changes taking place in the world at that time, especially in Europe, but also in Meiji Japan, and increasingly in the unstable British India. That change made for progress in the new Italy. But the genius of Lampedusa's great novel is portraying the gracefulness of the Prince of Lampedusa, Guilio Tomasi Fabrizio, as he comes not only to accept the inevitability of these changes, but to work with them in order to preserve something of the value of the older traditional way of life its centuries of accumulated history, its culture, its worldview for future generations. Likely, some of the old order needs purging, the novel suggests, though not all of it. But in order for this heritage to survive, even in a reduced form, it needs to change, to adapt, to accept new ways of thinking about such things as politics and society yes, and even religion, and certainly modernity. Hence the celebrated sentiment from the lips of Prince Tomasi Fabrizio, described incidentally as, as, a, as a highly cultivated but gentle great bear of a man. Unless we ourselves take a hand now on what is happening, something will be foisted upon us. If we want things to stay as they are, things 
will have to change. How can this enigmatic sentiment be applicable to our various political and social and religious contexts? In politics, of course, there will always be a struggle here, an example of which we experienced in our own nation as recently as a few weeks ago. Not a few were likely of the disposition to argue that in order for Canada to remain with the same vision of John A. Macdonald or Wilfrid Laurier or Lester Pearson or Pierre Trudeau, things would have to change. And so they did, as we all know. And Justin Trudeau's government is a witness to that. South of the border, an exhausting political struggle, fortunately contained within a democratic system, does continuous battle in the name of this question of protecting at least two very different responses to the key question, what is America? A topic so fecund that the well-known analyst Ronald Wright used it as the title of his most recent book. Here too, for both Democrats and Republicans, the refrain could well be, in order for America to remain as our founding fathers wanted it to be, things will have to change. Now surely too with religion in our time, we see the necessity of adjusting customs and traditions and theological worldviews to the forces of modernity, however they are defined. And as a student of comparative religion and world history, I'm fascinated by the topic of how religions change or don't change, not so much in their key scripturally based beliefs, but in how they adapt those beliefs to a world so urgent in its changing social and knowledge-based landscape. All faiths have branches or denominations or schools or sects which refuse to adjust to new realities, new ways of thinking, and by consequence, uh, new scientific information, that sort of thing might not easily blend into an old treasured understanding of reality. Sometimes a respected spiritual leader or thinker may come along who assumes the role of a serious gadfly, subtly or maybe not so subtly arguing as Prince Fabrizio does in The Leopard, that in order for things to stay as they are, things will have to change. Recent examples in our own Christian tradition might be the retired Anglican bishops, Richard Holloway of Edinburgh, David Jenkins of Durham, and John Shelby Spong of New Jersey. The latter in particular caused a huge conservative uproar with his 1999 book, why Christianity must change or die. I have to admit, I appreciated these profoundly stimulating studies, but they received a cool reception by many of my clerical colleagues who weren't willing to take the same leap proposed by these bishops. Well, no one needs reminding of the dangers inherent in a faith that cannot or will not adjust to new reality. Looking abroad and trying personally to avoid a censorious position here, I see, for example, traditional Theravada Buddhism becoming increasingly hidebound and politicized by a nasty nationalism in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, unable to modernize, or a Hinduism in India that currently resists accommodation with the urgent racial and political realities of that great struggling nation. Even more prominent are the challenges confronting the progressive wing of Islam, something that emerged a thousand years ago during the religion's golden age, when traditional Islamic law and theology were extraordinarily progressive, 
resulting in famous philosophical and legal schools, open to knowledge of the world and to technology and to science as it was then made available. Always in the background, however, was a desire by some to emulate the social and political con conditions of seventh century Arabia, the time of the prophet. The so-called Salafists who kept alive in part the extremism and the tragedy of what has emerged recently with Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and Daesh or Islamic State and these other grim groups. For exponents of this form of the Muslim faith, any change perceived as necessary is a regressive one, not progressive. But all religions, not just Islam, periodically have to struggle with this reluctance to adapt to new intellectual or social or political circumstances. What then do you think of Prince Fabrizio's famous sentence? If we want things to remain the same, things will have to change. What's your opinion of that? Are you able to perhaps see how this insightful refrain could be useful to you personally as you manage affairs of family or work or of your own worldview and spiritual beliefs? There might well be something important here that warrants our attention at all sorts of junctures in our lives. Above all, urging us to have a certain boldness in reviewing how we respond to all the things made precious to us, keeping them as precious as they deserve to be, but bold enough to change their place in our lives, if necessary, to adjust our worldview to new realities, perhaps to make us more accepting of the ways of thinking of other people, or to make our faith more loving and charitable, willing to take a chance on a new way of expressing itself. What better example of this could there be than Angela Merkel, Germany's great chancellor, and in many ways the conscience of Christian Europe? Daughter of a Lutheran pastor, to be sure, but herself a renowned scientist, she knows things had to change if her people and her faith are to live up to righteousness and principle. She has, as we all know, done this by accommodating a million of the world's weary and dispossessed, that vast human migration that so urgently needs protection from the scourge of human malfeasance that marks large parts of the Middle East and Africa. Of course, she's not without her critics. There are many who would say that there is a serious backlash by those who argue that Muslims in particular are not compatible with Germany's culture and society. But Angela Merkel has boldly carried through. Well, none of us, of course, are in a position of authority like Chancellor Merkel. But we can, nonetheless, periodically pause in the name of our faith to assess how our actions represent the treasured gospel that we accept and that most of us have grown up with. And indeed, to reflect on the great responsibility and the privilege that human life is, capable of adjusting its beliefs and cultural background to accept new realities and changes which will never cease to confront us. Now in all of this, of course, as Christians, we have the gospel of our Lord to guide us. And as this next hymn reminds us, God is our strength and refuge, our present help in trouble, and we therefore will not fear, though the earth should change. Amen.